from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon. I am Grant Harris. I am head of the European Reading Room and I, here at the Library of Congress, and I welcome you to uh, the European Division. We're here in the European Division Conference Room, and we're going to listen to Jonathan Kapilov speak about quantifying the Soviet economic and social crisis of 1920, food supply, rail transport, fuel, and demographics. Uh, Mr. Kapilov has earned his B.A. in 1980 from Columbia University, where he studied under the notable historian of Russia, Mark Ryef. He earned his M.A. and uh, C. Phil degree in 1984 from the University of California at Berkeley, where he studied under notable historians Nicholas Gasanovsky and Martin Malia. Uh, now, this is really a uh, kind of a continuation, if you will, of a, a talk that Jonathan gave last year, really a brilliant uh, talk uh, here in the same room, November 12 of 2015. Uh, that talk was entitled The Geography of Hunger, How Lenin Handled Russia's Food Supply Crisis of Winter 1990-1920. And uh, we're, we're very happy to have Jonathan back here again. Uh, Jonathan has done some really deep research using Library of Congress resources, and uh, we're, we're very pleased to have him uh, uncover all these resources that we have and, uh, and make use of them. And uh, he's a good speaker, as you will see. So, uh, Jonathan, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you for being here. Grant, thanks, thanks very much for the uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I think it may have been a little too charitable. Uh, uh, I do want to stress that this um, talk is a thematic and historical continuation of the talk I gave last November that was mainly focused on food supply. And uh, a significant part of this talk will come back to food supply uh, later on in the hour. And, uh, uh, let me just ask, can you, can you hear OK from there? Yeah. All right. uh, but uh, the focus of this talk is going to be more on the issue of transport and fuel and really the crisis and near collapse of the entire Russian-Soviet rail network uh, by early 1920. And so uh, what I want to emphasize from the beginning, and uh, again, I could not be more thankful to the Library of Congress for this, is that uh, I've mainly been working almost exclusively really with uh, primary source materials from the period 1919, 1920. Uh, I've used a couple of primary source materials and actually a key monograph that was published in 1922. And that monograph in 1922, which is a very, very rare volume, uh, helped me tie all of this together. But uh, again, uh, what I have seen uh, is that uh, there's a tremendous amount of material, primary source material printed at the time um, that I consider to be very reliable in terms of information about what was going on both quantitatively and qualitatively during this period. Uh, so I really want to try to share with everyone, and especially the library staff, give them a sense of the uniqueness and um, special quality of a lot of these primary source materials. Uh, that's really one of the main things I want to accomplish in the talk today. I'm here to uh, give a narrative of, uh, on this subject that I've talked about. Um, and according to the title. But I'd also like to address three other questions, and if I haven't, then I, I kind of left everyone a little um, hanging a little bit in terms of what this primary source material uh, offers. And so in addition to talking about demography, food supply, and, and especially about the transport system, and specifically the rail transport system, I'd like to answer three questions. Uh, one is the role that Wood played during the Civil War, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on that. If one can't understand the role that Wood played as the crucial fuel during the Civil War period, especially compared to what existed prior to 1917, you really can't get an understanding of what was going on in European Russia 
and especially how the peasants were living and what the state expected of peasants uh, at the time. Uh, two other questions I want to address um, are what was Lenin's role in all of this? Uh, but I wanted to focus again on what was going on qualitatively and quantitatively and then bring Lenin back in towards, towards the very end. And then finally, and although it has a pejorative connotation and I don't mean it this way, I wanted to answer the question uh, um, of something that was discussed at the time. It had a specific connotation, the phrase I'm about to use in 1920. Uh, the English translation is, um, uh, those who do not work, they shall not eat. Uh, what did that mean? It had a very specific policy connotation. It obviously has potentially much more pejorative connotation in the context of the Civil War and lack of food and so forth. But in the process of this um, talk, I, I want to try to answer those questions as well. Uh, let me just start by saying uh, that I, I do feel that the amount of primary source material here at the Library of Congress for the period 1919, 1920 has been vastly underappreciated. That's what I've been working with. Uh, I'm not here to make comparisons um, with other libraries or other institutions. I've done a lot of work in the former Soviet Union. I also did a lot of work at the Hoover Institution. Um, I do believe that there are several volumes here that are probably unique in Western libraries. Uh, I don't think I could have put together the picture that I am going to try to present to you today without having access to the Hoover and then some very special things that are here at, at the Library of Congress. And just to give you one example, the library has a complete run in the original of the bulletin of the People's Commissariat of Transport, issues numbers 1 through 288, the entire run for uh, calendar year 19. It's, it's really remarkable, and without materials like that, I wouldn't have been able to put together the presentation that I'm about to give to you. So what I wanted to start, and I, uh, this is not meant as a review, it's meant to compare and contrast um, what was going on immediately before World War I, and then I'm going to move forward briefly to the war itself, and then to 1920 to give you a sense of what was going on with transport and specifically fuel. So I'm just going to step to the map here and um, give a quick synopsis of, of some things that happened um, going back even before 1914 at the beginning of World War I. And I'm going to point to the city of Baku here on the Caspian Sea. Uh, and Baku um, was really the first center in the entire world where oil was not only discovered but started to be produced in industrial quantities. Um, it, it even preceded a lot of what happened in the United States in the development of Standard Oil under the Rockefellers. And this is documented. It, it was such a major development in, in the world economy that it's not just something that would be documented in, in narrow Russian sources. If anyone has read the, the, the key book called The Prize by Daniel Jurgen, they will know that Baku was where um, oil first started to be used on a commercial and industrial level. And that was in the um, late 1870s, very early 1880s. And what happened was, uh, beginning around 1880, uh, and, and th this was a key technological breakthrough as well, oil was transported, transported from Baku uh, a couple of hundred miles uh, along the Caspian Sea uh, to the mouth of the Volga River. And from there, it was carried up the Volga by boat um, stopped in major cities, uh, 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 what was Tsaritsyn, uh, Saratov, uh, Samara, Kazan, Nizhnyovgorod, and then eventually made its way uh, either by river or later uh, by train to Moscow and St. Petersburg. This, this is before the end of the 20th century in very, very large amounts. And I have in my handout uh, a separate uh, explanation of Russian weights and measurements uh, that existed at the time of the revolution, prior to the revolution, through the revolution, through the Civil War. And the key Russian measurement uh, was a pood, which was approximately 36 pounds. And so from one of the sources that I have, although they were contemporary sources before World War I, uh, I just wanted to mention how many millions of poods of oil was transported from Baku on the Caspian Sea up to the mouth of Volga near Astrakhan and then subsequently up to Volga, Moscow, uh, St. Petersburg, all the other major parts of European Russia. 
So in 1912, and the source for this is uh, in a uh, special volume here at the Library of Congress called Narodne um, Chazyaistva. It was a journal published by the Supreme Council of the National Economy. Um, so an article that appeared in 1920 um, talks about in 1912, 268 million poods of oil were transported from the Caspian up to the Volga River and Astrakhan, subsequently up. 1913, 270 million poods. 1914, 244 million poods. 1915, first full year of World War I, increased 319 million poods. 1916, 337 million poods. Uh, then, as, as the war took more of a toll on Russia, a lot of men were drafted, there were labor shortages. In 1917, it fell to 280 million poods. Now here's the, the real introduction to my talk. In 1918, it went from 280 million poods in 1917 down to 74. And in 1919, it was zero. The reason being that with the conflict going on during the Civil War, the Volga River was cut at that time, uh, actually uh, initially by some Czech forces, who were there to participate on the Russian front in World War I. Uh, and really what happened during most of um, um, the Civil War was that the Soviet regime did not have access to Baku oil. There was no oil. And so that had tremendous consequences for the entire economy. Uh, the numbers that I cited should indicate that pre-revolutionary Russia, Russia during World War I, and uh, even at the, at the beginning of 1917, was a very, very oil-dependent economy. It, it was not as an advanced economy overall industrially as countries in, in Western Europe, but there was a very advanced oil economy and a transport economy. And one of the things that is, is discussed um, in many of the sources I've seen and it's referred to in Daniel Jurgen's book is that um, really by the 1890s, uh, a large amounts of foreign capital, names that we would recognize, uh, the Nobel family, the Rothschild family, they were investing very heavily in this entire industry and the transport of oil up the Volga. Um, very, very large investments. They, the, the Nobels and Rothschilds actually controlled most of the uh, production and the transport of oil along the Caspian Sea up the Volga and then into Russia. Uh, At what time did that start? Uh, it was certainly by 1900. Certainly by 1900, and there's a there's a very pronounced um, uh, change with each passing decade. Uh, beginning around 1890, it's a lot more than it was in 1880. It really got started in the late 1870s, early 1880s. Um, 1900 is already a benchmark compared to 1890. Now, um, I don't want to create the impression here that the czarist economy uh, was stronger than it really was. Uh, the country as a whole had a lot of very serious and social and economic problems. And just it's kind of something very interesting that Jurgen points out in his book that because of rising anti-Semitism in 1912, and it was probably a very good business move in retrospect, the Rothschilds basically threw almost all of their investments. So they were not expropriated at the time of the revolution. I don't believe that was the same case with the Nobel family. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about uh, was the development of the coal industry, and this is an area that's now been recently in the news, uh, mainly in the Donetsk Basin in the eastern Ukraine. And so, uh, without going into long uh, synopsis of the development of the Russian rail system, um, the eastern Ukraine uh, became a major source of coal that powered the Russian rail system. Um, and I want to talk about some other areas that also produce coal and, and go over some economic geography. But uh, from what I believe is a unique source here at the Library of Congress, published in 1922, uh, I have information about how much coal was produced and used um, in, um, in Russia. So in 1903, the uh, uh, use of coal by the Russian rail network was over a billion poots. Again, a poot is 36 pounds. By 1913, and again, I, I, Russia had a lot of economic and social problems, issues about uh, revolution, social justice. But the fact is, by 1913, what was slice, slightly over a billion poots used by the Russian nail, na rail network in 1903, that had more than doubled by 1913, as well as the, the, the length of the Russian nail, rail network. Excuse me. Now, I also want to stress 
that while there's a tremendous amount of, of coal production in the eastern Ukraine, there was so much demand for coal in the Russian economy that coal was imported from England. I, I don't know if it was from Newcastle or not, but a tremendous amount of coal was, was imported into St. Petersburg. Most of the coal that was used in St. Petersburg for heating actually came from England. And there was also uh, uh, coal from England that was imported to feed um, the Russian rail network and to power the Russian rail network. Uh, so these are two kind of key ec geographical economic facts of what happened uh, prior to the revolution. And I'm going to skip forward for one second and indicate, and I'll get more into detail about this, that as a result of the revolution and the Civil War, um, the Soviet regime really did not have access to Donetsk coal. Uh, a couple of other places that should be mentioned in terms of important economic background um, for what I'm going to start talking about in 1920 in a few minutes is that there were some even sources of coal in the Ural Mountains um, uh, near Chelyabinsk and north of there. There was also coal in Western Siberia, and that's Western Siberia really isn't on this map. Um, it's, we're getting close, but it's not included in this map. And so um, those, those sources of coal uh, were used. And prior to 1914, certainly 1917, the vast majority of the Russian nail, rail network um, used coal. Uh, there was some use of wood. Um, uh, wood was much harder to use, much less energy efficient than either coal or oil. But uh, basically, by 1914, around and according to this uh, unique monograph I found here at the Library of Congress, around 75 percent of the Russian rail network was powered by coal, around 10 percent by oil, and there's a way to power locomotives using oil, and then approximately 5 to 10 percent by wood. But all of the main rail connections in European Russia, the major rail routes, used coal or oil. Wood was used only on local lines or in Siberia in particular because there was a lot of wood in, in, in Siberia. And so one of the things I want to talk about, just getting back briefly to this oil being transferred, transported from Baku up to the mouth of the Volga River, is that uh, initially when steam came to the Volga River, it, it used wood. Wood was the source. It was only after 1880 that you had um, the use of oil to power the Volga fleet. And as you see the development of the Volga fleet, especially after 1890 and into the beginning of the 20th century, it is making leaps and bounds in terms of how energy efficient it is and how much cargo it can carry. So for instance, in 1914, there were over 200 million poods of various grains that were conveyed up the Volga. And basically in 1903, Rudolf Diesel licensed the diesel engine to the Nobel family. And you had the, um, the initial construction of diesel tugboats. Some of these diesel tugboats on, on the Volga could carry as much as on barges at one time, just one diesel uh, 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 engine uh, tugboat carrying several large barges, 500,000 poods of grain. That would be the equivalent of 500 rail cars of grain. Um, the, there's, a, there's a recognition from a lot of material, both primary and secondary, before the revolution, uh, during 1917 and afterwards, that one um, rail car, uh, standard Russian rail car, could carry around 1,000 poods of grain, which is 36,000 pounds, approximately 18 tons. So you had a tremendous, um, a tremendous uh, increase in the intensity and efficiency of, of the Volga commercial fleet in terms of delivering many things, not, not just grain, uh, but all kinds of building supplies, raw materials, uh, salt, many other things that were needed by the economy. And what we'll see is, is that by 1920, uh, the Soviet regime uh, had, had, had been going without for an entire full year, for all of 1919 and really a good part of 1918 as well, without access to any sources of coal or oil. And so I think one of the things that has really not been um, appreciated in, in histories of what was going on during the Civil War period 
was that the economy really became entirely dependent on wood. Uh, it, um, wood is a much more inefficient source of energy uh, than oil or coal. It is very hard uh, to use wood as the main source um, for locomotives. And that was the underlying reason why there was such a, a, a large transport crisis um, in Soviet controlled territory in European Russia uh, by 1920. And in fact, what I found in all these sources, and it's in, uh, I'm going to make an argument, uh, uh, people may want to swat me for it, but I'm going to make an argument that uh, Pravda and Izvestia are very, very important sources for understanding what was going on at the time. And not only in Pravda and Izvestia, but all of the um, primary source materials I found here at the Library of Congress, they always talk about uh, a con uh, the use of wood and they convert it to what they believed and, and they had good scientific basis for this, they may be approximations, what was the equivalent energy use in either coal or oil, and especially dealing with the railroads, they talk about the equivalent wood used and what that would have amounted to in coal. Um, and as I'm also going to explain, in April 1920, um, the, uh, the local Azeri government in Baku, which was supported by the British, um, uh, the Red Army eventually captured Baku in late April 1920. And all of a sudden, there, there is a change in the picture. A, a country that has not had access to oil suddenly has some access to oil. It, it, it's limited amounts, but it changes the whole uh, economic perspective of what is going on. And uh, it, it doesn't mean that everything changes immediately. In fact, it doesn't. And I will skip ahead and say, for instance, that at least through the end of 1920, well into 1921 and beyond, wood remained the single largest source for powering um, the Russian rail network. And that's what the Soviet regime had to deal with, was this uh, gathering of wood, the transporting of wood, and, and getting this wood to rail, local rail depots, local rail lines. Uh, it, procuring wood is a very, very difficult thing in large amounts. It has to be chopped. It has to be transported. Um, there are two ways, really, of transporting wood uh, in large volumes of the type that a rail network would need. You either need to send it down rivers or you have to have peasants haul it. And so one of the main th things that peasants did for the regime, and, and it, w it basically was a form of labor conscription, was hauling wood um, so that the rail system could work. Um, the other way to do it, if you send it down river, uh, has its downside, and, and this is discussed a tremendous amount in the primary source materials is the wood has a certain amount of humidity, um, then it's that, it, it, it is that much more difficult to burn in the boiler of a locomotive. And uh, there are numerous references to the fact that boilers either explode or break because the wood that is being put <laughs> into them is, is, is too humid. Th these are kind of what may sound like small details, but when, when you look at them from a larger picture and realize that wood was the main source for the Russian rail ne network, really, uh, beginning in 1918, it, 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 you, you get a sense of what people were really dealing with in trying to make this transport system work. So um, I wanted to just, I've given a handout. And in, in the handout, one of the handouts, um, I talked about, um, and I'm just going to summarize it quickly here, if I can find the right page here, uh, what are the what are the um, energy equivalents um, of, of, um, of wood um, compared to oil and coal? And it, it's very, very interesting because, um, uh, and I found it on uh, the, the uh, last page of um, the handout, uh, key Russian weights and measurements used at the time of the revolution and during the Civil War period. And basically, because there were uh, other sources of coal other than the coal here in the Donetsk Basin in Eastern Europe, in, in Eastern Ukraine. Um, it's very interesting. What it, so it basically says the basic measurement for wood was not by weight. It was by volume. It was called a cubic sajin. I've been trying to find out exactly what a cubic sajin equaled in terms of volume. I've, I've seen references in the law library uh, to a special volume there that I think is unique to the Library of Congress that it, uh, one rail car could hold 2.3 cubic sajins of wood. But whatever it was, one cubic sajin of wood was equivalent to 100 poods, 
or approximately 3,600 pounds of Donetsk coal. It was also equal to 100 pounds of Siberian coal. And um, there was co coal in the Urals, as I, as I mentioned. Um, Urals coal was less rich as an energy source uh, than Siberian or Donetsk coal. So one cubic sajan, it, uh, it took 150 poods of Urals coal to equal one cubic sajan of wood. There, there was some very low-grade coal near Moscow. That was the only coal that the regime had access to. And so coal from the Moscow, it took 250 poods of coal from the Moscow basin to equal one cubic sajan of wood. And then what is very, very interesting is it took only 70 poods of oil to be the equivalent of, of a cubic sajan of wood. So uh, I'm, I'm also going to mention just briefly two key data points here uh, that give you a sense of what was going on with the Russian nail rail network and, and, and what a tremendous um, uh, difficulty it, prevent, uh, it presented for running the entire economy. Um, first of all, um, and th this is in several primary sources, it's all, also mentioned in a key article in Pravda by the head of the um, Maine Fuel Administration, a guy named Alexander Lomov, is it took one full rail car of wood to move a train that was carrying, let's say, 11 to 12 cars of either grain, wood, whatever. It, it took one full rail car of wood to move that, um, that train and the cars it was carrying 100, 100 verse, which is only 66 miles. So if you want it, uh, here's Moscow, uh, here's Nizhny Novgorod, here's Kazan. The distance from Moscow to Nizhny Novgorod is approximately 275 miles. To Kazan, it's around 500 miles. If you wanted to move a train from Kazan to Moscow and, and you weren't going to pick up any wood along route, en route, you needed to have five, in effect, five rail cars just full of wood to get it that far. That gives you some sense of the inefficiencies and the, the huge headache, quite frankly, of trying to make a rail system like this work. Um, it's very interesting, after Baku was captured by the Red Army in late April 1920, there are numerous references to the fact that um, those rail cars that which, which can be re, uh, converted to oil use, again, there's, there's no coal available, or very little coal, only from the Moscow Basin, some from the Urals. Um, there's a reference to once uh, they can start reconverting some of these locomotives to oil use, uh, it would more than double the efficiency of what's involved in, in transporting any cargo. And there's a specific reference to uh, we, can trans we can use twice the number of locomotives than we could before to transport um, very scarce food supplies, especially grain. So you can see from some of these key data points how the transport system really constricted the entire economy. And I'm, I've got a lot more to say about that. But if you just start from those data points, you start to be able to see what it looked like for the people living at the time, and you get a sense of what Lenin and the people in the People's Commissariat of Transport, and Trotsky was People's Commissar of Transport for most of 1920, what, what they were dealing with in trying to make this beast work. It, it, was, it, it, it is really something that is almost unimaginable, and what I, what I would say, uh, uh, just to sum up this part of, the, of, of my presentation, is you can see that in many ways, um, European Russia under Soviet control, and, and there's a separate editorial comment, which I don't want to get into, how much it might have been the Bolsheviks' fault for this, not their fault, was it circumstances? I'm, I'm not here to editorialize on that. But you can see that if you look at where things were in 1920, just given some of the data points I've cited, that this is a country that went back to a time at least 50 years in its past. It may not have been as advanced as a lot of Western European countries, industrially and otherwise, but it had a very, very advanced oil industry. Uh, the economy was very dependent on the use of oil in factories, coal, the rail transport system, et cetera, et cetera. And basically what happened was um, the, the Soviet regime had to deal with a situation where they were trying to manage an economy and run a country that had gone more than 50 years back into its economic past. Um, and, and wood was really what this was about. It's how did you procure the wood? How did you transport to rail depots and rail lines? 
how did you line up enough rail cars of wood if you had to move a train, uh, let's say, 400 miles? That, that's a lot of verse. A verse is 0.66 miles, approximately. So uh, what I want to say is, and, and I want to go into more detail later, uh, and I'm starting to run short on time already, is that um, by 1920, uh, by really late 1919, the Civil War, in effect, is, is, is over militarily. There's, there's a war separately between um, Soviet Russia and, and Poland. But in terms of the white armies, uh, that whether they had democratic roots or, or what Soviets uh, called counter-revolutionary forces, they were more uh, people representing the landed gentry who wanted to get back their property. The Civil War had really come to an end by October 1919, late October 1919. Um, at one point, white forces had cut off the Volga River. That was in 1918. Uh, they were pushed back during the spring of 1919. They came very close to the Volga, but did not cut it off. Um, in spring of 1919, Anton Denikin met, um, organized a major military push out of the Ukraine in the direction of Moscow. He got within 250 miles of Moscow. But in late October, before he got to the key town of Tula, where there were major arms industries that, that supplied the Red Army, he was beaten back. And that was late October 1919. So basically what happened by the beginning of 1920 is you find a situation where um, there's a perception that uh, by the Soviet regime that they need to worry about Poland. There's an understanding that Poland could be a future aggressor. But for the first time, there's really very little in terms of, of real military action going on between the Red Army and various white forces, wherever they're coming from, whether it was uh, Siberia, the Urals, the Ukraine, so forth. Uh, it, it, the military conflict isn't over, but um, uh, Kolchak is being pushed very far back in Siberia very, very quickly. He's surrendering. A lot of his forces are giving up. Denikin is quickly uh, falling back. Um, regime conquers most of the Ukraine. There is kind of a last stand in the Crimea. But really, for all intents and purposes, the military conflict is over. And so what I found, the single most important source I ever found about the Civil War in terms of what was going on with the economy, what Lenin and the regime had to do, had to deal with once this was all over, was um, something almost found by chance. It wasn't even in the main um, uh, uh, catalog. It was in the Slavic Cyrillian Union catalog. And it was a, um, a key meeting that happened on the 25th of January, 1920. Um, I believe this is a unique document. Uh, I'm not a bibliographer. I'll, I'll leave it to the bibliographers to try to figure it out. But basically, it was a key meeting in Moscow. I believe that there were at least five or 600 people attending. Had key speeches by uh, Alexei Rykov, Trotsky, who I'm sure you've heard of, uh, some other people. And uh, it says on the outside of this, it's only 34 pages. This was um, copy forwarded by American Consul in Viborg, July 30th, 1920. That's what's on the cover here. Um, th this was a meeting that happened approximately five and a half months earlier on January 25th. And basically, I I've never seen a meeting or a speech like this, uh, uh, although there was a lot of very open talk uh, while Pravda and Izvesti were censored. It is remarkable how much openness there was and what they talked about. But this, this speech, mainly by Alexei Rykov, who's head of the um, Council, uh, Council, uh, Supreme Council of the National Economy, uh, he speaks as someone who believes in the communist regime and in the communist project. But it's really couched in terms that uh, anyone who believes in a market economy of any kind, whether capitalist or whatever, would have given this speech. And what Rykov says in this speech is that um, the economy is destroyed. And then he proceeds to give a lot of key data points for that. Uh, one of the things that I've read, the, the kind of one of the most famous histories of the Civil War period uh, by Edward Carr, talks in general terms about the fact that um, the economy declined by two thirds uh, between 1917 and 1923. Um, and there's a general recognition by all historians that, that uh, what, the, what the revolution and Civil War did to Soviet Russia. Uh, economically w w was a disaster. It, it was basically a complete collapse. But Rykov really puts some meat on the bones of this that I, I think is unique and makes that, that document unique. So one of the things he says is, is he says that um, because of the collapse of the transport system, 
uh, and then Trotsky also supports them on this in some important articles Trotsky contributes to Pravda, is Rikov says, we're here in Moscow, the Soviet regime kind of controls the central European part of Russia. But he says that um, we have no contact with the Urals. They're, we don't have enough trains, we can't make them work well enough, and the Urals is basically a separate economy. Uh, it's, it's been largely destroyed, or to a very large extent destroyed during the Civil War. But if we wanted to import iron ore from the Urals to Moscow and make metal in Moscow and St. Petersburg factories, right now, given the amount of trains and transport capacity we have, it would take us many decades to just get that started. And then he says, and uh, there was a very large textile industry in Russia b before the revolution. He said, if we wanted to take the cotton from Uzbekistan and bring it to Moscow and St. Petersburg, and there were large numbers of unemployed textile workers, he said that would take 20 years. So what the discussion is about in this long speech by Rikov, and he talks about the destruction of national wealth, almost as if he was a market economist. There, there are other references to other things. But what he says is there's a tremendous destruction of national wealth here. And the fact is that the transport system is not something that allows us to recreate this whole national economy that existed before World War I and that clearly had, had suffered a lot during the course of World War I as well. I don't, I don't want to minimize the importance of that. And so what he's saying is we don't have the trains to bring grain from the Volga region to central Russia. These are basically grain deficit areas. They don't grow enough grain to feed the local population. Uh, we don't have the trains to bring the coal from eastern, uh, from eastern Ukraine to, to make our locomotives work. And so the question is, at the beginning of 1920, is it possible to, to basically stitch together the whole country? Is it possible? And they really wonder aloud, is it possible at all? And then B, if it is possible, how, will, how do we do it? And uh, one of the interesting things that Rikov cites is he says specifically, and I'm not an economist, I'm not here to uh, get into economic statistics or how much did the economy decline. I'm much more interested in the qualitative um, aspects of what was going on with some quantita important quantitative measurements. But Rikov does cite the fact that the economy has declined by two-thirds. He, he does use that number. And then he cites another very scary statistic. He says that um, because we don't have access to oil, this is in early 1920, uh, we lack all the lubricants that we need uh, to do railroad repairs. Um, uh, we can't feed the workers who would be fixing locomotives um, because they've run away to the countryside. That's where the food is. There, there's no real food in Moscow because the trains can't bring it there in sufficient quantities. And so it's kind of a Rubik's Cube. How do you start putting this all back together? And he cites, in addition to the, the constraints that I mentioned about how much wood do you need to make things move, and you know, you need one rail car of wood just to move one of these trains 100, 100 versts or 66 miles, what, what happens is, is that because there's been no ongoing repairs of locomotives for many years now, and it started to really decline in 1914, he cites the fact that he believes, and there are no exact numbers, it's a period of, of really tremendous economic chaos. He says, um, we believe at this point we have 3,800 locomotives that are operational. They, they may not be in good repair, but at least they're moving. They may need repairs, but um, we're down to 3,800. The number in 1914 of locomotives that were available was 20,000. And uh, there was a lot of information in all of these primary source materials. What were the number of locomotives that were produced in 1919? Um, it was 149. In, um, in the years before the revolution, and there are a lot of statistics in these uh, Soviet, uh, Soviet journals from 1920 that are unique here to the library, I believe, in terms of a complete set. Um, the, the economy was building a th up to 1,000 locomotives a year. And so there is a key article in Pravda that raises the question. It's a logical question. Uh, I haven't seen it addressed anyplace else. At what point do we get to a number of locomotives as they're declining where we can't really effectively move anything? It, it may be that the Urals are a separate economy themselves. The Ukraine's a separate economy. 
Um, there, there's, there's a wish to bring grain from Siberia because Western Siberia is actually a net grain producing area. Uh, that comes up later uh, in the 20s. I don't want to get into it. When Stalin wants to get more grain, he goes after the Urals. It's called the Urals Siberian method. He's after extra grain in the Urals and in Western Siberia. And Western Siberia probably had a uh, grain surplus of around 100 million poods a year. Lenin's very interested in that, let me, let me assure you. But the problem is, even if, if they could get their hands on it, how do you transport this when, when one rail car of wood will take you 66 miles? Okay, uh, that's assuming you have the wood to begin with. So uh, what, what I found in this key article in Pravda is the question is asked specifically, what's the number where the system no longer works at all? It, it's, it's, it's very much on the verge of collapse. And a very interesting fellow writes an article in Pravda and says, if we get to 2,500, it's over. There, there's, we shouldn't even stop trying anymore. There's going to be no more economy. You know, there won't be a regime. And there's a lot of open discussion about uh, can the regime survive? The, the word in Russian, Sushestovani, is used throughout these primary source documents. On a couple of occasions, Lenin uses it. It's rare, but he uses it. He even makes a reference to the way things were at the end of 1919. The regime cannot continue that way. He says it in, in, a, in, a, in a key speech uh, that's included in his collected works. So what Rikov um, uh, explains at this key meeting that the American consul in Viborg got a hold of is that he thinks they have around 3,800. 2,500 seems to be kind of the barrier where you can just forget about it. And the concern is, is that with each passing month, there, there are 200 less working locomotives every month. So they start doing projections. If it keeps going this way, by the end of 1920, there, there's, there's nothing more to talk about. That's why there are these discussions about it's a, it's a fight for survival. It's a, they use the word borba in Russian, fight. They use the word sushestvanya, uh, survival. And so really what happens, and I, I, I know time is short here, is that Trotsky takes the lead. Trotsky is really the key person in 1920, other than Lenin. And Trotsky comes up with a plan. How do we start repairing these locomotives? How do we do that? And um, what you see is there is, a, there is a period in late, I know this sounds very specific, but there's a period in late February 1920 till approximately the first few weeks of April where everyone is questioning whether the regime will survive. And it's in exactly that time that um, Lenin, Trotsky, um, the whole senior Bolshevik leadership makes a very concerted effort to turn this around and I have some statistics in the handbook, and it starts to show that this decline of approximately 200 locomotives a month is, is staunched. Um, they're just starting to hold even. And then as you get into summer 1920, Trotsky, um, as commissar of transport, starts to really turn this around. Not, not in a big way, it doesn't, it doesn't get them a lot of breathing room, but the fact that, they're, that the regime is on life support, it's on the precip a precipice, that that is, is, that comes to an end. They're not making the rail system as a whole work uh, a whole lot better, but there's no longer a sense our, our necks are on the block. That, that is just not the case. So I'm running a little short on time. I wanted to say a couple of things about Trotsky. Um, the library here has um, um, uh, Tr Trotsky's complete uh, works or close approximation to them uh, were published. The library has a complete has all of the volumes. Volume 15, which I know may sound esoteric, that covers everything he did in 1920. And basically what Trotsky did in late May 1920 as Commissar of Transport was he issued what, what became a famous order. It was called Order Number 1042. And that was an industrial plan to produce spare parts so that these locomotives could be fixed. And in the meantime, they're starting to get a little trickle of oil from Baku by summer 1920. It's coming up to Volga. Um, and they're starting to make, they're starting to refigure and, and uh, redo some of the locomotives that only could use wood. And they're starting to see tremendous advantages from that. They're not really getting Donetsk coal, and I've included a document in the handout that shows as late as October 1920, only a tenth of the mine workers that were working in the Donetsk 
coal basin before World War I were, were employed at that time. So the maximum amount that they could produce was one tenth. There was a tremendous amount of, of, um, of chaos and economic anarchy in the Ukraine, a lot of fighting back and forth. Um, when the Poles did attack in, in April, May 1920, they got very far into the Ukraine. They actually captured Kiev. They didn't get that far. Stalin was in the Ukraine for most of 1920. And his, his, his goal was to try to restore the coal industry in the Ukraine. When the Poles attacked, his focus was much more on the military side of things. So what I wanted to just talk about briefly, uh, and uh, this is what I, I think one of the key things I got out of all the primary source documents I used here, I, I do think the, the documents at the Hoover are very important. Things that I got in the Soviet archives are very important too is there were three key um, government bodies throughout the course of 1920 that made policy, debated policy, et cetera, et cetera. And those were basically the, the Soviet hierarchy. Uh, the senior part of that was the Council of People's Commissars. Lenin was chairman of the Council of People's Commissars. So under the Council of People's Commissars, you had the Commissariat of Transport. You had the Commissariat of Food Supply, et cetera, et cetera. And then obviously you had the Communist Party and there was a Politburo. The Politburo really uh, made overarching general policy decisions. So when the Poles attacked, for instance, questions about how that attack should be handled in general terms were decided by the Politburo. But the Politburo really didn't do a lot more than that. The key institution, and when I was at Columbia, this is what Mark Rive always suggested, uh, always uh, emphasized to me, is that if you can get a hold of kind of the institutional history of what was going on, you can really kind of almost decode the most important things after that. And what happens in, in, in early February, although it's going this direction in January at the time of this speech that I referred to, is Lenin um, reinforces well, what was previously called the, the, um, um, the Council of Defense. The Council of Defense coordinated all uh, defensive industrial activity as the Red Army fought the White Armies, uh, really up until October 1919. And what Lenin and Trotsky decide, and it's as much Trotsky as Lenin, is they decide that the Council of Defense has to be expanded, and it's renamed the Council of Labor and Defense. And so what happens during the course of 1920, and there's a very good book that is, uh, 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 goes into the research of this. It's a translation of English. Uh, uh, there's an English translation. Uh, it's documents from the Hoover Institution called The Origin of Forced Labor in the Soviet State, 1917-1921, if you just want to pass it around, is the, the Council of Labor Defense actually becomes the key central economic organ to deal with this mess that I've described. The transport system, lack of food, uh, the demographic issues of, of workers running away from the main industrial centers, uh, and then the factories are, are not open. Rikov cites the fact that there are probably 3,300 factories under Soviet control. He says that, that over 1,800 of them are closed. There's no one working there. They're, they're, they're barred, they're shut. That's because workers have run away. They can't be fed. If they can't be fed, they're not gonna work. And the regime can't provide them enough food to stay there and work. It, it's really incredible uh, whole speech and, and, and analysis by, by Rikov on January 25th, 1920. And so what happens is the Council of Labor and Defense becomes the central economic uh, planning organ. And it's really through the Council of Labor and Defense that Trotsky organizes this effort to retool um, and repair locomotives. Uh, if you want to accept the number 3,800 in January 1920 and they're going down 200 a month, um, that gets turned around through Trotsky's efforts as Minister of Transport and then working through the Council of Labor and Defense. And the reason the Council of Labor and Defense is so important is that it also organizes um, conscript labor, especially peasant labor, to go, go chop the wood and transport it. And the main interaction between the Soviet state and the vast majority of the Russian population, which was the peasantry, was getting them to do uh, conscript labor to get wood because otherwise you, you didn't have a transport system. So I wanted to wrap up by saying that um, a lot of Trotsky's political career 
was tied up with this whole idea of, of conscripting the peasantry to, um, uh, to, to go chop this wood and, and cart it. Uh, that's, that's what they were doing. There were limitations on how much, of, how much the regime could enforce that, very, very serious limitations, because it didn't have enough food to have Red Army soldiers do it. Red Army soldiers were now conscripted on a regular basis to perform labor obligations. The reason that the peasantry was particularly an uh, inviting target was the peasants were told, if you perform your labor obligations, you bring your own bread. We don't have to supply it, but then we'll let you go. That, that is just the reality of what happened during 1920. The story with the industrial labor force in the major factories where they need to produce spare parts for the railroads is, and I have some information taken from 1920, uh, contemporary numbers, how much, how much food were these workers getting? On average, it was something like 15 to maybe 20 pounds of bread a month. That is not enough to perform heavy industrial labor. And I think the most interesting point about the whole chaos and just the whole fluidity of the situation throughout 1920 and beyond, because as I said, would remain the main source for fueling the Soviet transport system long after 1920, long into the new economic policy when the food supply dictatorship ended, um, was that these, these factories were not given enough food. And I cite statistics in, in, um, from these primary source documents. Some of the major factories that were trying to produce spare parts or build new Soviet locomotives, um, a lot of them were filling, fulfilling no more than 10% of the orders that they were asked to fulfill. Uh, there was one factory in the course of a month produced 0.9% of what Trotsky wanted under order number 1042. And so what you see is tremendous numbers of workers being encouraged, invited, uh, cajoled to come back to the factories where they work uh, with the promise that they will be fed. And they're fed for a while, and then food supply deliveries, for whatever reason, don't work out. And so there was approximately a 100% labor turnover throughout the course of 1920. And there's a lot of very good information about this. Even if it isn't exact, it's close enough to give you a sense of the fluidity of the situation. And how do you make this work if you're in control of the regime? How do you do this if you're Lenin and, and these top governing bodies? And, and the labor turnover for just the second half of 1920, after they started to get some oil, a little bit of coal starts to come from Ukraine. It was 60% just during the last six months of 1920. So I think I ought to wrap it up here. Um, uh, it's been an hour. There's a lot more that I could say. I would have liked to say more about Trotsky's role in this, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I've got to be. Five, five more minutes if uh, you need. OK, th thank you very much, Grant. So um, I, I guess what I wanted to say is, if you compare the initial situation in, as of January 25th, 1920, when Rikov gives this speech and talks about there's a separate Urals economy, there's a separate economy in the Ukraine, you've got Central European Russia kind of surviving on its own, and, and most of it, if it isn't, if it isn't uh, a net grain deficit situation, it's just barely producing enough food to feed itself. Um, what you see is, during the course of 1920, a very, very concerted effort to start trying to stitch all of these pieces back together. And what I can say is that by the end of 1920, the progress was very, very limited. Very, very limited, partly because the coal industry in the, in the um, eastern Ukraine had not been, um, had really made any significant progress. There was a key document, uh, you know, Trotsky uh, brought all of his papers with him uh, when uh, he was sent into exile by Stalin. And they've been donated to the Harvard University. There's the Trotsky Archive at, at Harvard. And so um, there's a key document in there. I believe it's dated um, early November. Uh, thank you. And he talks about the fact that the coal industry in, in Donetsk Basin still isn't working at the end of 1920. You do, do see some real progress in the Urals uh, by the end of 1920 compared to where it was in January. And by the way, the first labor armies are created in the Urals. The Urals is basically Trotsky's, I don't want to call it province, but it's his area. His people are in control there. They're the ones that are trying to reestablish um, the Urals metal industry. 
uh, the coal industry and the Urals and so forth. And what's very, very interesting, uh, again, the, the primary source material is really almost overwhelming, is that the Supreme Council of the National Economy, despite its name, did not run the economy. It was just basically the commissariat of heavy industry. And what you see is, um, as all of this territory is recaptured by the Soviet regime and eventually Siberia as well, within the Supreme Council of the National Economy, there are four or five separate divisions. So there is there is basically a division that controls industry in European Russia. And that is separate. Um, and Rikov runs it. He, he's the chairman. But there's a separate, whole separate division of the Supreme Council of the National Economy just for Ukraine. And it has no, no interaction with the Central European one. Then down here is where the Cossack area is. There is a separate Supreme Council of the National Economy for Southeast Russia. And there's a separate one for the Urals, and then finally one for Siberia. That is still the case at the end of 1920. So there is some progress made, but it's very limited. And I will end here by now by saying that this key monograph that I found that was published in 1922, it looks back at the end of 1920 and 1921. And basically what it says is that with the limited resources that the regime had, it started to get some oil, started to get a little bit of coal, coal also from the Urals, that the, the, the geographic dimensions of the area that the regime was controlling overwhelmed the resource, even the limited resources it could bring to bear when it started to get oil and coal, that simply the Ukraine remained separate from European Russia. Um, the Urals and Siberia remained separate from European Russia. And I do believe that that underlying economic crisis had a lot to do, not, not, not just the issue about food, had a lot to do with the recognition by Lenin and the Soviet government that they really had to make a major change. And that had a lot to do with why the new economic policy um, was declared in the spring of 1921. There are obviously other reasons. We know about the Kronstadt revolt and a lot of sailors and workers were revolting against the regime. But if you look at the real underlying economic reality of what where things stood by 1920 and where the limited progress was made by 19, end of 1921, in effect, the regime did not control the territory it had won from the white armies. It did not. Uh, it, it did several years later. But this was a tremendously difficult process, and it was a wood economy that, that took the entire country back more than 50 years. So I am going to end there. Yeah. Jonathan, thank you. That's stellar. Really good. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Listen, we'll, we'll try. If anybody has a question or two, uh, this has gone just just barely over an hour. But any, any questions right now? I'll ask you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so what about? Um, I guess it would be the Soviet Union then, in terms of trade. Could the trade for oil? Could the trade for coal with like Southeast Asia? Okay. Or yeah. So uh, I, I want I want to answer your question. But let me just give you a little bit of background um, uh, about uh, what was going on. So obviously, um, uh, one of the things I didn't mention was during most of the Civil War period, certainly through 1919, there was a major trade embargo. Uh, the Western European countries, what Lenin referred to as the Entente powers, refused to uh, trade because uh, they, they were actively supporting the white armies. and. Um, there's a lot of talk about there were some British soldiers dropped off in, uh, up here and near the Romansk area and Archangel, maybe with 600. The real Allied contribution to the white cause was that the armaments given, uh, bullets, machine guns, and everything, um, a lot of good economic work has been done, equaled the entire production of what the limited Soviet arms industry could produce for the Red Army. It was a major, major contribution. That embargo ended in the beginning of in, in January 1920. It's it's reported, uh, you know, in big bold letters in Pravda and Zvesti, and it's very important. The reality was was that there was no real trade until till later. But what happens in in January, February, March 1920, and and I, I do want to answer your specific question, is Trotsky's predecessor, the Commissar of Transport, a, a very skilled engineer named Krasin. Um, goes to England because the idea is he wants to start buying locomotives. And there's a Soviet trade delegation that's sent to England and to Western Europe. 
there are a lot of things the Soviet economy needs, or the, I would say the European and Russian economy under Soviet control needs. Uh, they need a lot of things. They need grain. They need many things. The only thing that Krasin is trying to get is locomotives. And Trotsky says in some of his key speeches in, in his collected works, and, and they're really remarkable. I can just tell you the notes just in that volume have information that you won't find anyplace else. But basically Trotsky says we won't be able to get any locomotives. Now in terms of oil, um, what happened is when this is why the regime got very lucky, and I, I, I should have mentioned this, and I want to get to your question. When, when the Red Army captured Baku, the big deal was there were 200 million poods of oil that had already been taken out of the ground. I don't know if they were literally in barrels, but they were ready to be shipped. And there had been a lot of destruction to some of the oil infrastructure in Baku. And so before 1914, Baku, I've seen a lot of information. Trotsky writes about it. Trotsky's an incredible writer, and not, not just flowerly, but he, he, he talks about things in great detail. He's of incredible use to anyone who wants to seriously study this period. And so up to 35 million poods of oil is being produced a month in Baku before the war. When the Red Army captures it, it's only 10 to 15 million. But the 200 million that's there allows them to start using it. And there's even talk that given how much they need to use, if they can transport it, that they're going to run out by 1922. And I'm sure we all recognize the name Armand Hammer. It was Armand Hammer that helped the Soviet Union restore this. And so in terms of trade, I, I can't, I, I would think that um, there's a lot more in um, the prize by Daniel Jurgen about how much oil, if any, was traded. But basically what you have by the beginning of 1920 is the effective end of the embargo, although there was no real trade until late 1920. Uh, then the, there was talk of trade with the Western countries. And one of the main things that, that, uh, that the regime had to trade was wood from the far northwest. From the far, that, that, that's one of the main things that they thought they could trade because the, the, the wood resources of, of, of European Russia, not even talking about Siberia, they're, they're, they're more than a third of, of all the forestry in the world at the time, going back to that time. So um, if you just repeat your question again, there, there is some trade. Um, I, I think that the regime needed whatever oil it had. I don't know if it yeah. traded in any oil. Uh, one of the things that was very interesting that they were trying to trade, um, and it gives you a sense of how special time. Uh, Siberia was a, was a tremendous producer of very high quality butter. And so there was a tremendous amount of butter exported from Siberia, for instance, to England and to Western Europe. And so that was one of the things they were looking at trading. Wood, butter, um, those were the two main things. I believe they wanted to hold on to the oil. But there were other things they needed, technology. Y you see during this period that the entire um, telegraphic system becomes totally unreliable. Well, all the telegraph and coding equipment was imported from the West. So they're after that. You know, anything they could do to restore the telegraph system, they want to do that. Telephones. Telephones were produced in Russia before the revolution, but there are not a lot of people around who know how to fix them. And the skilled laborers that run away to the countryside, the regime's looking, where, where are the people that can repair our telephones and our telegraphs? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, John, I think that it was trade with Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, I'm sorry. Well, I knew they had some, some big oil reserves there. Uh, um, so. Well, there was always traditionally, I mean, you can see yeah. Iran right in this little right, there was a tremendous amount of trade on the Caspian Sea between Russia yeah, yeah. and Iran no, no. prior, yes. Um, but I don't, I don't think there was any oil going to Southeast Asia. I don't, I don't believe so. But I would look at Jurgen because he is really yeah. the definitive I, I, I source on all of it. It's, a, it's an unbelievably good book, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I hope that answers your question yeah. at least part. But no, there, there's no real large amounts of trade. It's only later in you know, 1922, 23 that the regime starts trading. Um, uh, and I can also want, add one more thing about locomotives. Why was it so hard to repair all these locomotives? Well, you had all these private companies before the revolution um, producing locomotives. So there wasn't one standard locomotive. So if you needed some, a spare part for company number 23 that was producing locomotives in St. Petersburg, and you couldn't find it down in, 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 in Samara, how did you repair the locomotives there? It, it, was, it was an incredible problem. And that's what Trotsky was looking at, uh, 
a, a way to systemize which spare parts we had and which we didn't. And really what happened was you had, and this is the, the, the term at the time that's used throughout all the primary source material, you had what were called locomotive graveyards because locomotives that weren't working, they were stripped of their spare parts. And if, if locomotive number 23 from that company in St. Petersburg you know, could be found and there was another locomotive 23 that needed that particular spare part, it was just stripped away. And they had, you know, they had lo locomotive graveyards of hundreds of locomotives at a time. They were just stripping them. That's what they were doing. All right, I think we're about out of Any quick question on this? So we'll, we'll have to end there. Thank you uh, so much for coming. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, Thanks very much. One more time. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.